us today. Recording in progress. Um, uh, reminder, I'm Brad Calvert. I'm the director of the Regional Planning and Development Division uh, at, at Dr. Cog. Um, my, my shop has been sort of taking the lead uh, on this conversation uh, since sort of the May-June uh, timeframe. So thank you everyone uh, for joining us for session four of our inclusionary zoning uh, learning cohort. Uh, we know that this series has been a significant time commitment uh, for everyone. So we really appreciate you all staying engaged and carving out time from very busy schedules uh, to participate. Um, uh, I don't think it's news to anyone that we are now in the holiday season, which means uh, scheduling can be a little difficult to navigate. So we had a bit of a break uh, between our last meeting, which I think was late September uh, and today. So I appreciate uh, you all um, having some flexibility in terms of the cadence uh, of our meetings. Um, as a quick reminder, as I mentioned, we're in sort of session four. Uh, all other, all previous meeting materials are actually on the Dr. Cog website. So if you want to go back and look at previous presentations, uh, you can certainly locate those. They're generally uh, associated with the calendar event uh, for each of these meetings. If you can't find something you're looking for, reach out to us either via chat today or, or later, and we'll make sure and, and connect you with those uh, materials. Um, as sort of a, an orientation to what we'll be doing today, um, our previous sessions have really kind of focused on some of the more technical aspects of inclusionary zoning ordinances and programs, uh, whether that's understanding the economics uh, and how uh, ultimately the, the development community views uh, these uh, ordinances uh, to some of the important considerations when it comes to uh, design and structure. Uh, today's conversation, we're actually sort of making a pretty purposeful shift um, and we're really maybe more in the sort of hearts and minds uh, side of this uh, conversation, um, really sort of how you build support uh, with sort of uh, marketing and messaging uh, oriented to a variety of different audiences that obviously uh, have to be on board to move forward with, with programs uh, such as these. Um, as we've done in, in many of our meetings, we actually are thrilled to have an, an external guest or expert, uh, in this case, joining us all the way from uh, Atlanta, Georgia. We've had some folks from the Bay Area um, I have flown to both. It takes a lot longer to fly to Atlanta, and I've had the pleasure of driving there recently, and that was not much fun. Um, so we appreciate Josh uh, spending some time with us. Uh, Rodney is going to help uh, with that session here in a second. Uh, additionally, we have three individuals um, that have participated in this group uh, stepping into expanded roles uh, today. So we really appreciate uh, Rodney, Sue, and Brad spending some time with us over the last few weeks to prep for today, um, as well as uh, helping out with today's uh, conversation. So Rodney's going to um, introduce our first speaker uh, here in a second and moderate um, uh, the conversation in, in some ways from a unique sort of firsthand uh, perspective. And I'm sure Rodney will cover that uh, in his remarks. Uh, and Brad and Sue um, are going to uh, also participate and moderate with Dr. Cog's staff, uh, sort of a small breakout conversation that we'll have uh, a little bit later, sort of partnering up with some Dr. Cog team uh, to, to lead those conversations. So if you've got a burning question uh, related to sort of your own uh, journey uh, locally to, to be thinking through uh, the inclusionary zoning um, uh, approach, uh, please keep those in mind because those should be front and center uh, during those breakout uh, conversations. I'll do just a couple quick housekeeping things before turning it over to Rodney. Um, uh, we are not planning um, to do sort of virtual uh, introductions sort of going around the room. So please feel free uh, to use uh, uh, the chat feature. And I just related to that, I just saw Joffrey noted if you've got any updates that you think the group might be interested in in terms of things you've been working on, I think chat would be a great way to do that as well. Um, I will also mention, I'm pretty confident we are, will be PowerPointless today. So we are going to be spending a lot of time um, in sort of uh, gallery mode if that's the setting uh, you've chosen. So if you're comfortable turning on your camera, I would certainly encourage you to do that because we're going to be spending a lot of time really just sort of having conversations uh, as groups. Um, in terms of any kind of technical uh, issues related to Zoom, we've got a special guest technical moderator today, Cam Kennedy, who has lent us some time, which we really appreciate. Um, Cam is working behind the scenes on all things related to Zoom. So if you have anything that's kind of going on that you want some one-to-one -one uh, assistance, feel free to direct message uh, Cam and he, he can do his best to respond. We've been fortunate, uh, fingers crossed through this series to not have any sort of cataclysmic uh, technical issues. I so hope that uh, continues today. Um, so with that quick kind of orientation and overview, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Rodney Milton, uh, Community Development Manager for the City of Aurora to get us going um, for the first session 
Uh, as with past sessions, please note uh, any questions in the chat as Rodney and Josh are having uh, their conversation and or be ready to maybe unmute um, after they've concluded their presentation to ask any, any questions. So we'll, we're definitely informal uh, today, but uh, certainly keep your questions in mind so that we can have a good conversation when it's, when it's time to do that. So with that, I'll kick it over to you, Rodney. All right, thank you, Brad. And good afternoon, everybody. Um, I you know, genuinely appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation, particularly with someone that I view as a really good friend of mine, Josh Humphreys who is the Director of Housing and Community Development for the City of Atlanta. Um, you will note that we're friends, so don't be offended by our banter and back and forth. We're gonna keep this casual, have a genuine conversation about sort of the history that preceded uh, the implementation and then the transfer of uh, ownership, if you will, of the program and then some, some 2.0 issues. So I'll kick it off to you, Josh. We can we can talk about this. Oh, good. Thanks, Rodney. And on cue, we have an ambulance uh, going by. Uh, so welcome uh, from Atlanta. Um, but the whole city uh, welcomes uh, welcomes uh, you to the call or something like that. Uh, so I, uh, as Rodney mentioned, I'm Josh and uh, I work for the city of Atlanta. Um, I came to the city I mean, I guess it was just a few months after the uh, the inclusionary zoning ordinance was passed. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about what, you know, the ongoing uh, communications and, and where we're at with it now. Uh, but Rodney, I think maybe to, to kick it off, I, I'd i love to, to kind of hear a little more about what the general environment was like when you started the conversation. I know that you um, and uh, a particular council member who just got elected right. mayor of Atlanta right. last night uh, yes. played, a, played a big role um in, in the years leading up to that uh so talk a little bit about just kind of the, the environment and like why iz became a conversation around housing affordability to begin with yeah so i i would say that you know interestingly enough in 2006 2007 there was an early early conversation about inclusionary zoning that kind of died um then uh um mayor shirley franken it's sort of convenient housing task force and it sort of died and it picked up again Right around 2015, 2016, 2015 in Atlanta saw a burst in multifamily development, particularly around the Atlanta Beltline. Um, and there was conversation always around affordable housing and what that looked like. And there was a crisis associated with it. And so that was in the, the temperature of the community was sort of what is Atlanta going to do? This was a pressing issue. There were lots of housing strategies. So Invest Atlanta had released in 2015 a housing strategy. That's the development authority. And so there was a lot of conversation in the air. Um, 2016 rolls around, 2017. Then council member Andre Dickens convened a bunch of us through interdepartmentally, right? So uh, planning, I was in housing at the time. Um, he convened the Beltline folks, he convened Law, he convened Invest Atlanta, he convened all these folks and stuck us in a room for, I don't know, it was Friday at two to four o'clock every, for almost two years. And I say that because the political will to do that is what I so much appreciated about his approach. Um, but that was, it was in the air that everyone was trying to say, you know, you've got to figure out a solution for this affordable housing. And right now where all the development, well, excuse me, at that point, all the development was around luxury housing. And that's important to note because there was a lot of housing production, but it was all high end luxury condos and luxury units. And so folks were really concerned about what a tool would look like to address that type of situation. And Rodney, for, for context, is this group familiar with the Atlanta Beltline? And have you talked about that much in the past? I mean, I hope they are. But if they're not, that's a that's a, a major, massive infrastructure project around the core of the city of Atlanta, connecting 45 neighborhoods through proposed transit, uh, but trails, parks, um, and and they have a mandate to create 5,600 affordable units in their lifespan, right? And so it's important to note that that was a driving force in terms of market 
uh, rate housing. Everywhere the Beltline touched, market rate housing was just exploding and transferring, uh, transforming the city of Atlanta. And with, with it being a, a large, a major public infrastructure project, did that play a role in IZ coming to the top as, as, as one of the potential tools? Yeah, and I also think that that earlier in the conversation, 20, 2006, 2007, one of the fears was rent control and, and takings conversations that kind of shut down IZ as a conversation. And so as we were looking at ways to implement it on this side, um, location was key. So this public infrastructure project kind of cured that takings conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, and, and so that, that kind of brought to the fore, you know. Well, and, and the big part of that is, is, is that in the state of Georgia, there's so, you know, state of Georgia is a difficult state sometimes to, <laughs> to be a large city in. And, right. um, and we have, uh, and, and one of the challenges around the, the state's preemption or rent control and, and navigating major public investment and saying, hey, like this is this is a major public benefit um, that's driving economic development and in exchange for that, then inclusionary zoning makes sense. And I think that played a, a, a role um, in making that viable. Um, yeah. and, and maybe just for, for a bit of context, if you're not familiar, we've got a, a, a someone's gonna share a, the screen, I think, um, of an image of, of where the geography ended up yeah. on there. And I think that's helpful um, because it did, in Atlanta, we have a very uh, geographically based, um, inclusionary zoning. Um, so right. could you talk a little bit about uh, just as you're working to sell it, the geography of it all? Yeah. How I, I know, you know, I'll talk a bit about the Grove Park expansion in, in, yeah. in a minute, but the pink area is what eventually became our inclusionary zoning district. So you're selling it to, to residents, selling it to council, I mean, oh, yeah. all the different stakeholders that you got to get buy in on developers. Absolutely. So as part of the marketing and messaging campaign, it began almost immediately when we were having these early conversations and it started with developers and uh, council member and now mayor uh, uh, Andre Dickens um, was intent on including developers really, really early on in the process to make, make sure they were helping shape what the outcome would be. Um, and so that sale was early and continual. But when it came to selling the community, um, once we had the program together, once we, we created, you know, visuals, fact, fact sheets, um, FAQs, those sort of things, the Atlanta, you know, area has a unique structure, a community engagement structure that has built in neighborhood planning units. So there's 25 planning units and each one of them has, you know, communal organization built in, right? And so what we did to sell to the community was we went to every single planning unit and we, meaning that group of, of folks, the, the council member, I went to the ones that were near my house, you know, it was kind of strategic, right? So, but we went twice. We went first to educate and second to get a vote. And we had the support first before we introduced uh, the, the ordinance of all 25 MPUs, which was incredible. When it comes to opposition, because I know you're 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 gonna you know you know how to, what was what did opposition look like? Interestingly enough, opposition was mostly from the advocates, the housing advocates, who said the AMI that we had chosen, the area median income that we had chosen, wasn't low enough. So we had selected sixty percent and eighty percent um, because when working with developers, they said, "Listen, that's as far as we can go without additional deeper subsidies." Um, it's at or below, so technically it's still allowable, right? Um, but the advocates were like, you're not going low enough and it's not going to be deep enough. And that was where the opposition was. And they were almost the source of just shutting down the entire thing, if you can imagine. So the other conversations were around uh, Buckhead, which in Denver is probably the Cherry Creek area, um, more affluent areas. They were all in because we couch the messaging around traffic and congestion and the fact that co-locating folks who could uh, work and that who work in that community without having to drive to that community could potentially cut down on traffic. So that was the messaging that you heard uh, in the north. Um, 
and and in the south there was a little bit of controversy in terms of more affordable housing but truthfully this was tying it to the market and so that's that was some of the messaging and marketing that allowed us to get almost nearly unanimous support from all of the mpus um so i see a note in here asking about the the belt line so the the pink area is it varies a bit, but it's about a half mile buffer on either side of the of the belt line. The belt line is actually a loop around the downtown core. It's an old um, railroad um, connection belt, a like loop um, that's being uh, that's turned into this green belt. And been right. kind of going on it. So, but so that that's why that's a very odd geography uh, this year. Um, <laughs> and it's a zoning overlay. So, uh, yeah. 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 Um, so what? To, I want to go back real quick to this advocate conversation because i think that's one that's an ongoing conversation um that, that not only in the before uh selling but also even now that uh we still get a lot of pressure from the housing advocate community um that our amis are not um we, we don't ask for a high enough percentage of affordable units and we don't um require uh low enough uh median income requirements um and i and i do think that's me in my mind and Rodney, i'd love to hear your thoughts on this but that's one of the fundamental challenges of inclusionary zoning is that uh, sometimes the rhetoric can get like very silver bullety, like, oh, right. this is how we're going to fix affordable housing in the nope. city. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, this is a relatively incremental tool. I think a helpful tool and an important one, but but it's it incremental in the sense that you have a little, a few amount of units spread throughout all the new development in a given area or in a whole city. Um, and the, you know, the idea of this is that it would not be, uh, you know, additional subsidy, right? We're, we're talking about right. unsubsidized dedicated right. affordable units. And unsubsidized units is a different scale, you know, a 30% median income, for instance. I, I don't think there is um, any scenario that, that I can imagine that you could require that of a developer without subsidy alongside of it to help, you know, make up the loss they're going to take. And so I think it, it's, it's, you know, on the front end, on the back end, all throughout, you know, yeah. I think the pressure from the housing advocate community, I, th I think that was not unique to Atlanta. I would assume that a lot of other cities deal with that too. Um, yeah. But to me, it's about placing inclusionary zoning as the type of tool that it is. What type of housing can it provide? What scale of housing can it provide? It's long-term impact versus like short-term big numbers. Um, and I think that's, that's an ongoing struggle um, yeah. even now. I don't know, but was that something, I mean, did that come uh. up much when you were talking about it early on? Oh yeah, absolutely. And when it comes so so when it comes to controlling the message, a lot of council and electeds, we had to make sure that because we did one on ones with council, right? So it all I believe sixteen council members we did one on ones. We guarded against that of that silver bullet thinking, right? Because it's a major policy initiative. They wanted to get on board. They could see what the potential win could be. Um, but again, it is a tool among other tools. And it's a tool that is unique to solving a market related problem, right? It does, it wouldn't work well. It's not, wasn't designed for more housing authority related AMIs. And we, it was incredible. We, we, we had to do some deep, deep connections, coffee, you know, all of that stuff with the advocates to, to make that point come across. Uh, because you're absolutely right. Folks can run away with the fact that now we have IZ, now we're solving the affordable housing uh, crisis. And this is the tool that's going to solve it. And so, you know, I don't, we tried our best to make sure our enthusiasm for the tool up front didn't bleed into that kind of rhetoric. And so we made sure that it was within the housing spectrum. This is the tool for this particular. And, and I think the location helped with that, right? So we didn't do a citywide because that would have been a different you know, conversation. Having it around the belt line, you began to, to sort of uh, address anti-displacement issues, or this is a gentrification mitigation strategy as opposed to just solving affordable housing. And that may be essentially, you know, how we shaped the conversation. But again, I'd be interested from my point of view, having, you know, once you inherited the program, um, and thank you for that, um, what's it look like now, right? What, now that it's run for a couple of years, so it was implemented in 2018, it's now 2021. 
where are you seeing that conversation go now? Um, and is it is it easier? Is it harder of a sell? Yeah, you know, I think uh, we earlier this year released our kind of three year report, kind of on the first three years, and you know, assess market trends kind of in the three years prior, three years prior to it and, and three years after, um, you know, the, the units that have been developed and, and a number of different things, kind of some, some myth busting around. We have a big townhouse trend in, in Atlanta. I don't know if that's the case in Denver, you know, the trend of, oh, well, you don't require for sale um, inclusionary zoning. So everyone's building townhouses instead. So there was a lot of that type of rhetoric that we um, were able to, you know, use data to mitigate a bit. I, I think that the challenge of from housing advocates is probably where the loudest is. I, I think where we're, the, the tough part of inclusionary zoning to me from an ongoing narrative standpoint is you get kind of pinched on both sides. Um, and and the, the both sides, I say, would be you have the housing advocates saying, saying like, we're not getting enough affordability. We're not getting enough units out of this. We're not getting low enough median income units for it. And, and the early returns, I, I think, are especially because this is not citywide, are relatively nominal. You know, we were talking, we're looking at 300 some odd units over the course of three years, which is not a lot of units set aside as part of the IZ program. And so we got hit pretty hard on it not being enough units. And I think that it's uh, a little short-sighted because this is something that's going to exist uh, for many years, likely uh, decades, and, and that it will continue to build significantly over time. So, so we didn't hit on that on that one side, and then you know you get the kind of the continual refrain from developers of, oh, you're making it economically not viable, or it's you know it's pushing us out. Atlanta has a large suburban population, and uh, we there's competition with suburban areas, and so there's kind of a, a refrain of, oh, we're just going to go to some you know wealthy suburb and build this instead of building it here because because of IZ, and you know. We don't see much of that in the data, but that's where right. we, there's a lot of there's a lot of rhetoric around that. So I think that's that's. But to me, I think that's the push and pull. I mean, Rodney, that's not new to what you experienced either. That's just I think that's kind of an ongoing conversation, um, and one where I feel like we found it a happy enough medium where we're gonna get we're gonna get kind of pushed a little bit on it. But I, I think that we're in a spot where we should we stay the course and and, and really believe in where it's gonna go. Um, so that I mean, so that's generally where it is. Um, we. The other thing for me is, uh, and, and our team rather, is looking at ways to improve it, right? We're three years in, yeah. and this is an iterative process. And, um, there's geographic changes um, that, that can be considered, but there's also some, you know, policy changes related to it. What's working and what what's not working? Let's look at the yeah. AMIs. Let's look at the percentages. Let's, let's look at things that didn't make it into the first one and ask questions about why, why um, it didn't make it, whether or not we want to include it. So... You know, a couple of those, so we're getting ready right now and likely in the next like six to eight weeks, we'll begin uh, some more public conversations around this um, uh, on a few changes to the ordinance. And, and one thing that we did in this past year that I think helped the state set the stage on this is since we didn't do citywide, we, um, and we based it on this idea of major public investment being a, a trigger of sorts for in inclusionary zoning, um, the city announced on the, the blue um, outline here on your map, the, the potential expansion area. Um, this is near a large, you know, $30 million park that the city just built. And um, we expanded inclusionary zoning to this area earlier last year. So this is now in place as part of our inclusionary zoning district. Um, and that was in response to, hey, there's major public investment happening in the area of the city that has not seen a lot of investment, and we want to ensure that there's affordability and what's, what's to come. And so having that kind of idea of this is tied to major public investment really laid a lot of the groundwork for us to say, hey, this is a tool that we think makes sense to expand here and expand here for these reasons. Yeah. Um, what it also afforded us was to create, uh, to oh, experiment is probably not the right word, but to add some some changes to inclusionary zoning just to this district um, mm -hmm. that we would eventually like to add citywide. And one of those is including a, a for sale requirement. So this district, the blue district, but not the rest of it, includes a for sale requirement for uh, inclusionary zoning. Um, and it also did does incorporate a 30% median income option at a lower percentage rate. Oh, wow. Um, and okay. those are two things that we, yeah, yeah. So it's 5% set aside for 30%. AMI. Um, so it's a pretty small set aside, but it's a very low income. And so, um, you know, we'll see, we haven't had a developer take us up on it yet, but we thought it was a good thing to kind of 
you know, see how it works. And, and, and it, again, this is iterative of, in, in some ways of trying to, you know, continue making this better as we go. So we're looking at early next year, adding those requirements um, and options to um, the broader inclusionary zoning district. And then looking at other things as well. One of, one of the other ones, you know, you mentioned anti-displacement. There has been some challenges that, hey, you're creating new affordable units, but they're not necessarily for the residents that live there. Mm-hmm. Right. They're they're affordable. But, you know, you know, how can I ensure that the residents that are in that neighborhood actually have access to that? So we're, we're exploring some options for resident local resident preference so that we can yeah. have them a, a, a wait list that, hey, if you live in this neighborhood, you get a priority or yeah. there's a certain set aside among the IZ unit for residents that have lived in um, in a in a sub area or a geographic area that has IZ. Um, so there's some details we're still working out on that, but I think that for us, really, it's our goal of wanting to help residents stay in the neighborhoods they live in and not be um, displaced, specifically not displaced due to ma- major public investments, right? Um, but also for us to be more directly related to anti-displacement goals and some of the narratives that we've gotten that IZ is, you know, is even though it does a lot of good things, it's not necessarily right now directly helping residents that live in the, na- in the neighborhoods currently. Yeah, so that makes sense. That's where that is. You know, we had a lot of success, I guess I'll say, the last thing I'll say, so it's on the Grove Park area, you know, we, it was a very neighborhood expansion. So we had a lot of neighborhood level conversations, got a lot of support for that. Um, what will kick off early next year will be much larger. Um, and I think that there, there, there's a conversation on the table potentially about citywide because the uh, council member uh, uh, Dickens said, uh, Rodney mentioned that uh, was elected mayor last night, has spoken a lot about citywide IZ in the past. So I think that's something that's, potentially on the table for us uh, in the next year to consider as well. Yeah. Um, so, jo- Josh and Rodney, uh, Joffrey Capella with uh, Dr. Cog. Um, I wanted to pipe in with a question. I understand that the um, Inclusion Atlanta's program is expanding to include single family for sale housing product. What have been the challenges associated with messaging to stakeholders about this program change? Um, can I, I think there's a question related to that in the chat that I'll I'll take the first part, which is why was it excluded initially? And then, Josh, if you want to talk the, yeah, the second part really quickly, I think it was administration, the capacity of administration, to be flat out honest with you. When we looked at how the two programs will be managed, I did not have and I'm saying I, but my division that was at implementing this did not have the capacity um, to administer a home ownership component, which is completely different yeah. than the rental. And in these areas, um, the primary um, t- housing type was multifamily. This is, this is mostly multifamily until we saw those townhouses, luxury townhouses pop up. But that was originally the reason why. I guess, the, so I'll mention a couple of things. The, the for sale component could potentially include single family development, but it would it still only trigger if there are more than 10, 10 or more units. So you're looking at likely townhouses. There could be some areas of Atlanta are pretty low density. So there's like kind of suburban subdivision style development in, in some of the areas, um, maybe a limited amount at this point. But um, so a lot of this, are you're looking more like condos or townhouse type development where one would be set aside. Uh, the thing that we, from the administrative standpoint, because Rodney's right, that was something we beat our heads against for, for a while as well. Um, we've instituted something that we're calling a qualified administrator program. And I know this is more about the marketing of it, so I won't get into the details. But essentially, it, it's set up where the uh, affordable for sale products would go to a, a land trust, a community land trust. So it ensures long-term affordability of the for sale product, but it also reduces the city's administrative burden on, on doing so. And I think that Combining the like the the permanent affordability component to the land trust model, um, and then also reducing the administrative burden, and you know people don't necessarily trust government uh, compliance on things sometimes too. So bringing in a third party partner that's trusted um, that would that would manage the long term affordability, I think those those have all been really helpful selling points, um, and I think just make it a viable program that can have some sustainability to it. Love that. Great, thank you very much. Um, in order to, so that we can stay stay on time here, um, I, I want to uh, make sure that we shift to the next portion of our of our agenda. Um, I, I do see several questions, good questions about um, some general questions and specific questions about the Atlanta Inclusionary Zoning Program. Um, we'll make sure that we can route those to Josh and Rodney so they can take some time to address them. Um, 
And, uh, but thank you, Josh and Rodney for sharing the story of Atlanta's inclusionary zoning program, the uh, messaging as it has changed over the past several years. Um, and thank you for the engaging dialogue and discussion. Um, before we shift to our panel discussion, we have a polling question about messaging of inclusionary zoning. Now, please take a minute to complete the following polling question. If you could first navigate to menti.com and enter the eight digit code above. And I'll enter that into chat here. The question, these audiences have been well engaged with our jurisdictions messaging around inclusionary zoning. Those audiences here are community members, development community, elected officials, internal staff. Please rate on a scale of four for strongly agree to one for strongly disagree. Thank you. We have close to 14 participants, 14 or 15. Take another 30 seconds, make sure you get a chance to uh, weigh in on the polling question. Okay, great. I think we've uh, had a chance to level out of uh, the numbers leveling out at 11 or so participants. Um, and uh, another another one in there. So um, pretty interesting results. Um, elected official and development community, we're, our, our self-assessment here is showing, collective assessment here is about a two and internal staff listed to three. Uh, community members maybe have a ways to go in terms of their engagement. So perhaps these are not, not um, too surprising. Um, now I want to would like to welcome our panelists for the second part of this session, Brad Weinig and Sue Beckfergus. Brad is the Director of Catalytic Partnerships for the City and County of Denver, and Sue is the Social Policy and Housing Program Manager for the City of Fort Collins. Uh, you can find their bios in the attachment that was sent out on Monday morning, along with the bios of Josh Humphreys and, and Ronnie Milton. Brad and Sue, uh, welcome and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, I have two questions and then I will give you each two to three minutes to tell the kind of arc of your story about your respective jurisdictions journey relative to inclusionary zoning before we shift into breakout rooms in about 10 minutes or so. Um, so the first question, if you were taking this poll how would you rank them, these audiences, community members, development community, elected officials, internal staff? Sue, you wanna go? Sure, I guess so. We'll go alphabetical here with our last name, I guess. Um, well, hi everybody, happy afternoon. You know, inclusionary housing sounds so great. Everybody, you know, when you hear the theory um, it just sounds like everybody should be doing it. And so Fort Collins has been looking at this for quite a while. 
I know our first consultant study looking at a nexus study was in 2001. Um, and then it got to the point where it was justified for an impact fee. I hope inclusionary housing was only available, of course, for ownership product. That wasn't really what the city needed and the conversation died. Then in 2014, we looked at it again. We started to conduct a nexus study, but then I think we did a really good thing. We backed off and we did this comprehensive housing affordability policy study, which even today is a really good primer of all the different policies you could consider out there. So we didn't want to look at inclusionary housing in isolation, but we looked at it in this totalitary way. Um, as a result of that study, a lot of great policies were implemented, but we did not bite off inclusionary housing again. We backed off. But one of the important things we did was we started to construct and establish some internal structure for really getting the city organization to understand what it could and could not do. We did an, an inclusionary task force. Um, we did a, a housing affordability task force. We, we set up an executive team of all the different department heads, just to let them know this is what's going on in housing. This is a city priority and we all need to be educated together. And then when we got ready to do our most recent housing plan, we even convened an ad hoc council committee to look at housing and all of that touch on inclusionary housing. Now, when I was looking at these uh, ratings, um, Oh, and then I, I guess before I move on, uh, in 2020, we had a report out of the first task force, and then we created a 2.0. And the task force, one of the recommendations was an impact fee. And the reason that they did not um, recommend inclusionary housing, again, was it wasn't available for rental. That was our biggest production point. Um, it, we had some market overlap with pricing for restricted product, and it just wasn't a big enough fix for our community. So we really started to look at the impact fee in earnest. We did another study in 2020, it justified an impact fee, of course. Uh, you can never really charge as much as they can justify. And when we brought that forward, um, right about the same time, House Bill 1117 passed. And so that has really now changed the conversation for us. And we are updating our 2020 study to look at whether or not it is time to create a package of incentives that would work for our community, that would make IHO a good fit for us. So that's where we are right now um, in the big scheme of things. And in terms of the, the Menti poll, um, I would say our community members are about a two our development community would be a three because when we did that impact fee study, we got their attention big time. And so they came forward and actually helped us expand our planning effort. Our original plan had been to update an affordable housing strategic plan, but then um, we did this comprehensive housing plan. So we, we did make some changes based on the input that we got from the development community. And then the elected officials, I would say, are a two now, but probably were a three for last council. They were the ones that worked on the plan and did the ad hoc committee. And then lastly, internal staff, I'm going to give us, you know, a three to possibly a four, because we have, like I said, maintained these internal structures. We created a 2.0 um, internal task force just to make sure we were cascading internally all of the um, steps that are required to help us achieve our affordable housing goals. So we have, like everybody else, produced a lot of affordable housing. We're very proud of it in the last five years, but we did not make our five-year goal. And we need to come up with some additional tools, resources, and you know, really push the envelope on this. I think there was a question there real quick. Um, the impact fee we looked at and that we're still looking at would be both probably residential and commercial. Residential yields a lot more than commercial. 
Oh, and then we would prompt what we want to do, I think, would if we end up getting the inclusionary zoning ordinance right with the right package of incentives, we would still have an impact fee that would pick up anything our inclusionary housing ordinance missed. Like what Rodney was saying, if you have an ordinance that says 10 plus homes, well, maybe we'd have an impact fee on nine, my, you know, nine and less. Brad, I don't want to take all the time. Let me hand it off to you. Thank you, sir. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be much briefer given my history with the city and county of Denver is much shorter than yours with Fort Collins. Um, I think as folks who've been around the region probably know, the city of Denver has gone in a, I would say, a meandering path along these lines. 2002 to 2016, we did have an inclusionary zoning ordinance or IHO um, that applied only to for sale housing, as we've discussed, and the city of Denver chose to make that only apply to for sale developments of 30 units or more. And so outside of a couple of master plan kind of communities like Green Valley Ranch, then Stapleton, now Central Park, we didn't get a lot of production out of that. And so in 2016, council chose to kind of overhaul the whole system and instead replace it with what we now have in place, which is a linkage fee or an impact fee across all new development of all types, different fees per square foot, depending on which type you're building. But all of those funds then become locally dedicated to my department, the housing and stability, housing and stability department or host, to invest across the kind of housing spectrum of need. And now that 1117 has passed, we are in the throes of um, proposing a policy to once again reintroduce uh, inclusionary housing. We're calling it mandatory housing, mostly just to create a marketing distinction between what was the inclusionary ordinance from, from five years and more ago um, that will require all new multifamily developments um, to include on site affordability or pay a substantial fee in lieu instead. Um, and then the linkage fee will continue to uh, be assessed on all non-residential development and all small scale residential development, albeit at a, at a higher um, rate. So that's where we're at now. That's a two minute arc of our story. And in terms of um, engagement, you know, development, certainly I would put it a four. If there's anybody that develops in Denver that's not aware of what we're talking about, they, I think they've got their heads buried in the sand. Uh, we've been very intentional about reaching out to them in particular. I think we're, we're doing a pretty good job with elected officials and internal staff as well, mostly because that's a defined you know, subset of people. So I would give that a probably a three. In the community, I also gave a three, but I understand that it's just it, it's a much harder group to, 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 to meet where they're at, especially with these complicated tools that we're talking about. These are hard for developers to understand who live and breathe this stuff. And so it's real hard for somebody that's just an engaged citizen to to gather, but we are making a ton of efforts and meeting people where they're at, messaging in different ways, having websites, having email feedback. So I think I think by and large we're doing a pretty good job, and that's a lot of credit to uh, my colleague Annalise, who is in participation today, but has the day off from being a talking head. Great, great, thank you very much. I appreciate you um, both weighing in on the on the uh, survey, the polling results, um, as well as. Um, weaving into the um, arc of your story in brief um, to date. I, I do wanna make sure that we can transition into breakout rooms. Um, I thank you, Brad and Sue, for jumpstarting the conversation and sharing their respective jurisdictions evolving journey with inclusionary zoning at this point. I'm sure there'll, there'll be uh, more to come in the next, in the next few years. Um, now we are going to shift into two breakout rooms for further discussion with our two panelists moderated by Dr. Cog's staff. In just a moment, Cam will auto-assign participants into uh, one of two breakout rooms. Uh, we will be in that room for about 14 or 15 minutes. Uh, then the two panelists and Dr. Cog's staff will switch rooms and we will have another uh, 14, 15 minutes in that second room. After a quick round of intros, please be ready to ask questions of the panelists. Uh, Cam? Um, I it, thank you. Uh, recording in progress. Um, I, had, I hope everyone had an engaging discussion in um, both of your rooms as you switched around, um, as speakers switched around and so forth. Uh, we would now like to use most of the remaining time to determine if there's an appetite or demand for um, session five at this time. And if so, um, identify some possible topics um, for for a session that would, would occur in the in the new year. Um, how would you like to conclude this learning cohort? Would it be a survey, a close out discussion, conversation, another speaker panel type of session? 
Godfrey, I'll just I'll go I'll bring forward uh, something that came up. I, I think in both groups that we carried over the conversation and what became uh, room two that Sue's first uh, version sort of picked up and then um, I'm sort of using Rodney's terms and I'm not sure if Rodney's still here, um, but the way it was described is um, there may be some power in coming at this um, using sort of the same or similar platform, like as, as, the, as conversations are happening locally to ultimately orient terminology, language um, to similar efforts that are happening in other communities around the region may ultimately be super helpful uh, to folks that are pursuing uh, this work uh, locally, which is good. I mean, that's, I mean, in some ways that's the origin story as to why we really wanted to bring uh, this group together, but, but that was something that was brought forward uh, as maybe a good use of time, whether that's thought of as session five of uh, the cohort or maybe something we just convene uh, early next year is particularly if maybe some of the folks are really getting, uh, you know, knee or waist deep in some of their housing needs work that they're doing uh, with some of the DOLA funding. Uh, so I'd really kind of defer to the group as to like how and in what way, if that's of interest, uh, when that conversation is, is best, you know, had. Um, are, are we ready to do some of that or would folks want to spend a little bit more time um, kind of getting things sorted out uh, in your own community? So sorry, that was probably like five questions in one, but that was sort of the conversation in the last like 45 seconds of our last session. And happy for anyone else to clarify if I got that wrong. I think that would be great from the city of Louisville's perspective. I know there's a number of us that are potentially hopeful we're getting the STOLA funding. And if there's maybe kind of a working group of communities so that lessons learned, if somebody's going down a path, they can share those ideas. We could build upon that for one another since though we're all gonna be kind of digging into this at the same time. So um, I personally would love that as a resource. I think that would be helpful for us. I agree also and, and um, not to get too bureaucratic, but I like the idea of segmenting this group into, into where we are in sort of our trajectory of addressing the issue. So we're all over the spectrum here in terms of having tried this for 20 years versus being brand new versus being suburban versus urban. So I think the conversation is richer when you have, it's it's great across the board, but when you can kind of sympathize with each other's specific place and context is helpful as well. Okay, great. Um, those are, um, it sounds like there's a, it, probably a check-in in, um, three or four months or so, maybe, maybe two, um, at the very least. Is anyone interested in sharing where their jurisdiction is at and where they're struggling with relative to inclusionary zoning in, in a possible session five? In other words, would you like to workshop anything about your process or approach, um, and gain some perspective from this group? Well, we wouldn't be there in three months, but I wonder if we could have some kind of a repository or shared place for materials, right? For like the actual ordinances that people are drafting or the agenda item summaries so that we could learn how um, we're kind of selling this in other jurisdictions. I think that would be super helpful. I mean, one of the challenges that we're dealing here with in Golden is that we're going through a zoning code rewrite. At the same time, we're trying to figure out how to do affordable housing. And so it's almost like we've got to understand how do we do affordable housing it, 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 with the right incentives and the right strategies that, that also mesh with what's going on with our development code process. So I'm not sure if other cities are struggling with this at the same time. I know like we just did a growth ordinance piece. Um, and so I think just having those brainstorming sessions about you know what other cities are doing around that, around the planning processes to make sure that we're being the most effective we can and get the, getting the affordable housing developed. That, that seems a huge opportunity, Janet. I mean, Denver overhauled its zoning code in 2010 and really didn't use the opportunity to also create some of these more you know, affordable housing focused incentives and I wish we would have, right? And so it's a, it's a great tool to kind of say, look, we're doing both, right? We're, we're, we're rezoning, we're, we're creating density, hopefully where we can. And then in exchange, we expect you know, a contribution towards affordability. So I'm jealous. Yeah, of I, ideally our, um, our housing needs assessment and the housing needs strategy will take a yeah. look at where we are at that and build some strategies around that rewrite of the zoning code as well. We're in the process of updating our land use code and we're doing it in two phases. The first one is for residential 
an organization because it's kind of a Frankenstein code that's just been added to over time. And then um, after, then we're gonna do a phase two on non-residential, but we're really, really trying to incorporate new and improved incentives um, and use this opportunity to beef up what we're doing and what we hope to um, get as a result of what we're doing. The city of Aurora, um, we updated our code, uh, Unified Development Ordinance in 2019. It took years to do that. And the only um, really more progressive housing um, addition was the addition of ADUs. And, but it was only, you only can do accessory dwelling units in original Aurora you, and they must be alley loaded. So there were a lot of sort of conditions around it, but we, the, the, the IHO was a deal killer for the balance of the, of the code. And so it wasn't included. Yeah, this is Andrew here, and I appreciate Jeff's suggestion a little while ago about possibly splitting up into groups that are more similar. Um, you know, I feel like in Westminster, we're, we're a step or perhaps even a leap behind what things I'm hearing from most of you. We can't even figure out how to have this conversation with our city council. Our city council's not interested in housing that's anything greater than single family homes on 7,000 square foot lots. So, you know, I, I guess I'm looking for some technical assistance with, you know, to have a foundational understanding uh, with our legislative body um, before we get into the practical elements of, of creating a program. Andrew, can I respond to what you just said? Sure. Um, because I think one of the problems, at least where I live in Lakewood, is that we're tearing down single family homes and not building them at all and increasing density. But increasing density, when you're increasing it for a product that is much more expensive than the single family home you're tearing down, has been gentrifying our community and kicking people out of our community. So we need to be careful when that, and that's why I'm so excited about this. I'm not optimistic about Lakewood in general, but that, you know, exactly having inclusion, including actual affordable units. Because just saying that, I mean, if tearing down single family homes or only building high density, that, that doesn't provide affordable, only building affordable units provides affordable units. Okay, um, yeah, Kathy, um, we are. I, sorry, I, I did try to chat with you about this, but one thing we're seeing is um, Elevations Community Land Trust actually is in the process of purchasing public housing units from our housing authority and converting them into affordable condominiums. And some of them will, Great. some of them will, they'll look like a house, but they may have two or three units in them, or some of them will be a single family house. So we're, we are doing a preservation project for that purpose. That's okay, right, so they're actual affordable units then. I'm gonna, uh, we'll need to wrap up the discussion there. Um, and um, uh, we are going to, I'll kick it over to Brad very shortly, but uh, heard a lot of good suggestions. Um, I'm not hearing that we necessarily need a session five, but we will um, follow up with this group. Um, and perhaps it'll be smaller convenings and debriefs. So Brad, um, go ahead and if you could close this out in the next few minutes. Yeah, that'd be good. I'll, I'll be very quick because I know we're right at time. Um, and Joffrey's sort of alluding to this. We asked the question just now in part because we're doing a debrief tomorrow to figure out sort of where to take this next. So that's super instructive to kind of hear the perspective of, of this group because ultimately we're trying to serve uh, your needs. So just know that the staff is gonna, as Dr. Carr, gonna have this conversation tomorrow and figure out sort of what to do next. I just want to reiterate what I said earlier. Thank you so much for the time that you've given us uh, over four meetings over the last uh, six months. Um, this is sort of a new thing for us to do convening in this way, but it's something that we've been really interested in doing. Uh, so we've been doing a fair amount of sort of uh, building the airplane in flight. I think Brad, the other Brad also used uh, that saying earlier, we've been doing a fair amount of that. So just um, I appreciate you all sort of learning with us. Um, I just want to quickly shout out again to all the um, uh, peer learning cohort folks, but also to Dr. Cog staff who have been think giving this uh, these series of sessions a lot of thought, particularly to Joffrey who has been organizing and keeping us 
uh, on track. Um, we will, again, sort of use the remainder of this year to sort of figure out how and in what way we continue uh, the conversation in 2022. So just know you're going to hear from us uh, over the next few weeks. I, I know Joffrey just put the sort of post-session survey uh, in the chat, but we'll do that uh, via email as well. I just want to do two quick, super quick plugs. Uh, it's come up a lot already, but but Dola has money out there right now. If you were if you were not looking to that opportunity, I would strongly encourage you to do so. Um, there's a deadline on on December sixth for the next round. I sense they're going to have planning grant money uh, for next round in January. My conversations with Dola staff suggest that that might be the last round. So if if this is important to you and you think there's an opportunity to do uh, a housing needs assessment as well as well as some other sort of strategy work, I would encourage your community to take advantage now. Uh, and then finally, a more uh, self, uh, a plug in our own self-interest is Dr. Cog. Uh, we are currently um, soliciting nominations for our awards program for 2022. Uh, we always love to, to ultimately um, celebrate and recognize innovative uh, local planning policies and programs. So if there's something going on in your community that you think is uh, worthy of recognition uh, in that awards program, take a look at the Dr. Cog website and or reach out to me. Uh, we, we think there's all, all sorts of great work that's happened over the last couple of years that ought to be highlighted uh, during that awards program. So um, shameless plug on our part. Um, so again, uh, thank you everybody for hanging out for an extra two minutes uh, today. Any questions, um, uh, updates, suggestions are always appreciated. So feel free to reach out to any of us anytime. Thanks again uh, for hanging out with us uh, today and at our other sessions. Hope everybody has a good rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks, it. Take care. Thank you.